Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. The senseless man does not know, the fools do not understand, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be forever destroyed. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. For surely your enemies... Sorry. For surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured upon me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like the cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. That is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks, Dan. Let me say good morning to everyone. It's great to be with you all. For any who don't know me, my name's Ryan. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Forbes Baptist And as Andrew said a little earlier, we're returning now to the book of Psalms, so let me encourage you to keep your Bible open there in Psalm 92. If you haven't brought a Bible along with you, there are a number on the bookcase at the back. Please feel free to go and grab one if you like. Um, I will reread the text at some point during this message as well, so you can simply listen along. But it's a great day to be together, isn't it? It's a beautiful day outside. The goodness of God is evident in creation. We have the opportunity to pray for our brothers and sisters all around the world and we look forward with anticipation to both witnessing a baptism and sharing in the communion table together. These great reminders of the grace and salvation that we who believe have experienced through and in Christ. And providentially, the psalm scheduled for today carries a similar theme of joy as it encourages us to marvel together at God and his goodness and to sing his praise. Now, we'll come to the content of the psalm in just a moment. But as we've done with a number of these psalms that we've studied this term, it's worth noting the information that's given at the beginning in the subheading. In the NIV, this psalm is denoted as a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. Being designated a psalm, it simply includes it in this great book of songs that we have, Israel's hymn book and the church's first hymn book. The designation a song indicates that this is particularly a hymn written with the intent that it be sung corporately. Whilst many of the psalms in the Psalter, in the book of Psalms, are utilized by the church and by Israel before them, This one is particularly written for corporate worship. And it's noted there that it's written for the Sabbath day. This is the only psalm in the 150 that we have with this designation. The only psalm written explicitly for the gathered people of God on the Sabbath day. Now, oddly enough, the content of the psalm doesn't make any reference to the Sabbath. But it is important that we note that this was the intention of the original author under God's own guiding hand. Now, there are, I will admit, various understandings of the Christian Sabbath and how and if the original Jewish Sabbath continues in our day. For me personally, I believe that what we do on a Sunday morning is a Sabbath, a day set apart by Christ, the first day of the week. But for Israel, the Sabbath was the last day of the week and its observance was non-negotiable. The Sabbath was a God-ordained day of rest at the end of the working week. It was a day made holy by God during his period of creation. Where back in Genesis, we read that on the seventh day, God rested from his work. 
More than this, the expectation that the Sabbath would be upheld is outlined in the book of Exodus. And then once more clearly stated when God gave his Ten Commandments to his people, that they remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, the fourth commandment on the table of law. It was a day that was set aside to withdraw from work and toil, not simply the hardships of life that came as the result of sin, but a God-ordained pre-fall day of rest to withdraw from good things also and to focus on God. It was a day where the child of God was to rest from their regular labor, to pause, to meditate, to honor God in their life and gathered together as God's people. And so it's with that mindset that we must read the text of Psalm 92 and apply it to our lives. It is in the light of a God-given rest that we are to embrace with a focus on God. And so much as we have done today, regardless of your view of Sabbath, you have drawn aside, come together as God's people to look to him in praise. And that is what this psalm encourages. The key verse of this psalm, which was highlighted on the screen for you, is verse 8. You, Lord, are exalted forever. Or in the modern NIV, but you, Lord, are forever exalted. This psalm has at its heart and in its eye the exaltation of God. That's its purpose, that those who sing it might praise and honour God rightly, might lift high his name. This psalm and its contents are designed to stir your hearts and subsequently inspire your voices to sing the praise of God. God's holy people on God's holy day, making much of his holy name. And there are, I count, four ways in which we are encouraged to exalt the name of the Lord through this psalm. Now, it begins, of course, with the call to praise, but that is where I want to end this sermon. So what we're going to do is work backwards through this psalm, building to its high point, which is its opening verses. It will make sense, I hope, as we do it. Let's look at the four ways that the Lord is exalted and that we are encouraged to sing his praise through this psalm. Firstly, the Lord will be exalted through the lives of his people. I'm reading from verse 12 in Psalm 92. The psalmist writes, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. Well, as we've seen through a number of the Psalms that we've studied, the people of God are regularly likened to trees. It is a powerful image that is used throughout the Psalter to describe the life of one who is rooted and established in God and in his word. And here we are told that those who are in God, those who are dependent on him, those who trust in him and worship him, those who are described as righteous, that they will flourish like trees. They're described like the palm tree, which flourishes and stands strong despite arid surroundings. Whatever hardship may come, the palm tree is the one that remains. Even in our modern day, as we see depictions of hurricanes and catastrophes around our world, it is regular that when the debris settles, when the storm passes, when the rain lifts, though buildings have fallen, though cars may be on their sides, the palm trees remain. These immovable trees, these sturdy growing plants are an image of the one who is rooted and established in God. These palms grow rapidly and they are largely immovable. So too is the one who trusts in God. The other image that they are given is that of the cedar of Lebanon, a sturdy and immense tree that grew in the regions in which this psalm was written. It would have been eye-catching. It would have cast shade for people to rest. It was a good and healthy and strong tree. 
The image that the psalm, psalmist uses here is that of life and growth, vibrance and vitality. These trees are chosen to demonstrate what the righteous one is like, that the child of God is one who grows in strength and maturity, rooted and held firm in God's own grace, and here, the psalmist says, established in God's own house, within the security and the protection of God's own tending hand. The believer can grow with great strength. The psalmist goes on to say that one such person will, like these trees, bear fruit. They will display righteous acts. That is what fruit denotes throughout our scriptures. They will live and act in ways that honour God. They will bear much fruit, not simply early in their life, but all the days they live for God. The righteous deeds of righteous people will honour the righteous God. I cannot help but note that this is a perfect image for a Sabbath song. For a tree does not flourish because of its cleverness or its hard work or its own desire. No, the tree flourishes because of the work of the gardener who plants it, waters it, nurtures it and protects it. Surely God is exalted in such people, those whom he has called and implanted in his grace, the ones he nurtures and gives growth to. As such, all praise is due him, and, it, and his, it is his work in our lives. The Lord is exalted in his people. Secondly, we see in this psalm a familiar tone that has been encountered throughout a number of psalms, that the Lord is exalted in the destruction of the wicked. We're back up at verse 6 in Psalm 92. The psalmist writes, Senseless people do not know, fools do not understand, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are exalted forever. For surely your enemies, Lord, surely your enemies will perish, all evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured on me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. The Lord is exalted in the destruction of the wicked. It's a doctrine, it's a phrase that sits uncomfortably with many people. Perhaps even you yourself find it awkward to think that God could be glorified in destruction of people. It is particularly difficult for those who find comfort in the image of a loving God, but shy away from the truth that the same God is holy and righteous and wrathful. But let me assure you that God's word does not shy away from this reality, that God will punish wickedness, that God will bring justice upon those who are unrepentant. Those whose sin is left uncovered by the blood of Christ. Whether this be evil in the spiritual realms or the evil of fallen humanity in this broken and sinful world, our scriptures declare again and again that God will not let sin go unpunished forever. And here in this psalm, as in others we have considered, the psalmist finds both comfort and and praise in this knowledge. There is comfort in the knowledge that though wickedness is all around, it will not endure. That though wickedness may be unrepented of, it will not ultimately go unpunished. And here again, the psalmist sees this as a prompt for praise as he casts his mind to those senseless fools destined for destruction. Back in Psalm 14, verse 1, we read the words, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The fool throughout Psalms is described as such. It is the one who rejects God. Despite the evidence of God in creation, despite the good news of what God had done in Israel, and today, despite the good news what he has done in Christ and the gospel, 
The fool is the one who rejects this. And our scriptures say that unless they turn to Christ in repentance, they will be punished eternally for their sin. Here the psalmist likens these senseless fools to grass, an image that contrasts the sturdiness of the trees of the righteous. The grass is fleeting. It comes briefly, and though it thrives for a season, it is ultimately cut down, burned, or destroyed. The grass is nothing. It is momentary. And the psalmist understands here that when it comes to pass that God destroys such foolishness, such sinfulness, those who are opposed to his righteousness, he will be exalted in displaying his holy judgments, in upholding his righteous decree, in fulfilling his promises, God will be exalted in the praises of his people as his righteous ones bear witness to this aspect of his perfect character. Yes, we will praise him for his great love, but equally we will praise him for his holiness, for his justice duly administered. Again, this is a great notion for a Sabbath psalm. It encourages the believer as we withdraw from the injustices of the world, as we gather together to focus on God and his righteousness in whom there is no sin, we are reminded that the sin around us will be dealt with one way or another. Either it will be dealt with and atoned in the sacrifice of Christ or in the punishment of sinners. One way or another, these future deeds of God will lead his people to praise him. And it is these future deeds of God that follow on in this psalm from the more general consideration of what God has already done. This takes us to our third way in which God is exalted in this psalm. God is exalted in the work of his hands. In your Bibles there, we're now at verse 4 and 5, where the psalmist sings, For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. This praise of God, this consideration of his work and his character is one of the chief goals of the Sabbath rest. To consider God. To reorient your heart and mind to think and dwell on who he is and what he has done. The immediate response to this should be praise. Yes, the burdens of life can occupy our minds. The hardships or the pleasures can distract us from God. But when we pause like this, when we put off distraction, when we come away from the things that demand our attention day by day and week by week, as we come together, we remind ourselves about God. And we rightly refocus ourselves each week on him. For Israel, in the Psalms, we see that the consideration of God's work was regularly an opportunity to be reminded of the promises that God had made. Or to consider his creation and the marvels of the world and universe around them to look at the deliverance and the history of God's people as they were brought from slavery and into his land, opportunities to consider his goodness and his providence day by day, and for Israel, importantly, a chance to reflect on his law that he had stated and given over the years. Well, we, friends, as we gather, can do that and more. The history of God has expanded beyond the point of this psalm's writing to now include what we recall together. That God came in flesh as Jesus Christ. That God has revealed himself to us more fully. That God is with us by his spirit if we have come to follow Christ. We gather each week to remind ourselves again and again of the gospel, the good story of salvation, 
of Christ's life and ministry, his death and resurrection that took us from darkness and into his wonderful light, that drew us from death to life, that shifted us from those grassy fields to the sturdiness of trees planted in God's own courts. As such people, how could we do anything but praise our great God? And how much more shall we pray him on this day set apart, set apart each week? Finally, we see God exalted in this psalm in one last way. The first and I believe most prominent way. God is exalted in the praises of his people. At verse 1. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning, your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. It is good and right, begins the psalmist, to praise the Lord. Of course, it is obvious that it is good to praise a good and great God. He deserves that praise. But I think included in this notion is the idea that it is good for us also. It is right to praise God, but it is good for us to do it, particularly in the gathered setting on the day that he has set aside each week for this. It is good to come and sing his praise together. Whether the songs are your preference, whether you prefer the guitar over the ten-stringed lyre, Whatever your view on drums, it is good to sing praise to God. It is good for you to withdraw from the hecticness of life, from the squabbles of family, the demands of work, the stresses and pressures that are on you. It is good to stop and to sing together. Psalm 147 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. And in our New Testament, we're commanded to sing. In Colossians 3.16, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. God desires and commands the praise of his people. He has given us the gift of music, some more so than others. And he has given us all voices to make joyful noise to him. And it is good when we do that. It inclines the heart and mind to God. People regularly sing praise to the things that they adore. Why do you think we sing at the football? Why do people sing along to music on the radio or on Spotify for those who don't know what a radio is? <laughs> God has put music in our hearts and it is right that we use it in his praise and in his honour. And the psalmist says here that we should do it morning and night, that we should consider God's love, his loving kindness, first thing each day. As we are blessed with another sunrise, as our eyes open and the life in our souls is present once more, we should praise God for his love. How fitting that our hearts and voices, silent through the night, would awake and be inclined to him, first thing. And at the other end of the day, to recognize that there is no hour too late to praise our God, especially for his faithfulness. His faithfulness, which is unfailing throughout each day, whatever may have passed, to remind ourselves that God is good, that God is with us. It is all too easy to have our minds occupied with the events of the day. Instead, the psalmists encourage you to incline your mind and your voice to God. As, that, as the day draws to its end. Brothers and sisters, it is good for us to sing praise to our God day by day, 
and especially when we gather together to celebrate what God has done. I'm going to pray, and then we are indeed going to sing praise together. Would you join with me in prayer? Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you once more for your word, which teaches us all we need for faith and for life. And this morning, Lord, as we have been reminded, we thank you for the gift of song. We thank you for the gifts that you have given those who can play musical instruments and for all of us who are given voice to sing however well your praises. Lord, we see in your scriptures that you have ordained praise from your people's lips, that you delight in our song when we sing to you, that you instruct us to sing to one another as we sing your praise. And so we ask, Lord, that in light of this reminder this morning, we would not come together to sing as something that is an obligation or a burden, that you would steer us from our own preferences and simply help us to praise you well. And Lord, we ask now that as we sing, you might stir our hearts and minds to think of all that you have done and to praise you for your faithfulness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.